Let's turn now to the passage we were considering in the morning, which you'll find in the letter to the Hebrews and chapter 9. The last few verses, it is a difficult chapter, but we need to read from verse 24, I think, just to get the sense of it. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands. That's a reference to the tabernacle in which the high priest served which are copies of the true. In other words, the tabernacle was a type of heaven itself, but rather into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often, since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, And to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. The last two verses. As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Now, this morning and tonight, we're looking at these verses which connect ourselves and Christ perhaps in in an unusual way, and it's not easy perhaps to see the force of it immediately. They connect us to Christ, first of all, in the experience of death. The writer tells us that we all die, and we die once. He tells us also that Christ dies and that he dies once. Again, we're connected to Christ because we experience a kind of reappearance after our death. On our part, we all appear at the judgment seat of Christ, and we saw something of that in the morning. There you have it in verse 27. It is appointed for men, that's you, me, all of us, to die once, but after this, the judgment. We appear there at the judgment seat of Christ. Christ, too, after he dies once, he has a reappearance to make. At the end of verse 28, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin, for salvation. And that salvation he accomplishes fully for us when he sits on the judgment seat and when he assigns our place in the everlasting heaven. So he appears for us to bring salvation for us in its completeness, in its fullness, at the second coming. Now, critically, all these deaths and appearances are connected together by God's appointing them. That, that's really taking us to the key here. It's all God's appointing. As it is appointed for men to die one time, and after this, an appointed judgment, so it is appointed for Christ to be offered once, and it is appointed for him to appear a second time without sin for salvation. So it's all to do with God's appointment. That lifts, of course, as I stressed in the morning, it lifts our deaths, Christ's deaths, and everything that happens, it lifts it out of the realm of nature and into the realm of what is strictly supernatural. It is God's appointment. Our life and our death, our birth and our death are appointments in the hands of God. And we saw in the morning how God does appoint our death, and he also appoints our appearance at the judgment seat 
of Christ. And these are uh, awesome thoughts. Paul, in fact, when he speaks in 2 Corinthians 5 of the judgment seat of Christ, when he, when he uses the expression appear there, we must all appear or we must be exposed at the judgment seat of Christ, he refers to it in the very next verse as a terror, he says. Knowing, therefore, he says, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's why he preaches. The great impetus, the great motive he had in preaching the gospel was all to do with the unseen thing. He says, I, I look at unseen things. I don't look at human tribunals or human assessments. I, I'm not bothered, he says, with, with what people think of myself. Rather, he says, I look at the great tribunal to come. I, I look at the judge of all the earth sitting there. I look at Christ. Out of his mouth proceeds a sharp two-edged sword of judgment and he makes the cleavage and the separation between the just and the unjust, and knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, he says, we persuade men. Now, the only way to escape that terror, the only way to escape the fear of death, or if you like, the only way to escape death itself is in Christ. Christ is the key. I stress that in the morning. He is life. He alone has the life that enables you to escape death. If you don't know Christ, you've got no life. You've only got death, eternal death, in the desolation of hell. But in Christ, you find life. There's the way of escape. Now, it seems strange in a way that we find the way of escape in someone who died himself. I mean, surely, surely the one who gives his life is somebody who doesn't know death. Somebody who has nothing to do with death, but not so. Rather, the writer here glories in the fact that Christ was once offered. And because he is once offered, he will appear a second time apart from sin, whatever that means, we'll see later. Because he's once offered, he will appear a second time for our salvation. He will absolutely bring life and immortality to light, not just in the gospel, but when he returns in glorious power and raises us from the dead. So the answer to death is very much in Christ. Now let's look then tonight, not at our death and our judgment, but let's look tonight at Christ's death and at Christ bringing salvation at his own second coming. Now, first, the death of Christ. That expression means a lot to us. We think of it immediately in certain terms. Um, we think of it accomplishing certain things. But there's a, there's a way in which it's good for us to step back from the expression and just to think of how paradoxical a thing it is, how oxymoronic it is, as it were, to, to use an expression like that in the first, first place, the death of Christ. After all, who is he but the son of the living God? The son of the living God. As the ancient creed puts it, very God of very God. As Peter confessed him, thou art the Christ, the anointed, the son of the living God. And as the son of the living God, he has life, and he has life in himself. And God gave him to have life in himself, even in his incarnate state, as the Son of Man. He doesn't appear as the Son of Man as something less than God. Lo and behold, although he is the Son of Man, he still has life in himself, and he has power to give life to others. He calls, and people are converted. He gives the shout when he returns a second time, and the bodies rise from the grave. And when all appear before the judgment seat, lo and behold, it is the judgment seat of Christ. And that's a surprise. That's a surprise. He's the one who sits in it. The Father, he says, judges no one. Isn't that astonishing? The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Why? Well, he says, so that men should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. And how do we honor the Father? Well, as the God of all, and as the judge of all the earth. 
And what less are we to say about Christ? If he sits on the judgment seat of Christ, if he judges all men, what is he but very God of very God? The one has power, who has power to give life, and the one who has authority to judge the death of Christ. This is the one who said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And of course he died and the scriptures tell us that he died. Mystery of mysteries, the one who is life dies. Now of course the point here is that this death is appointed by God. It is appointed by God. It's a special appointment. Peter emphasizes emphasizes that in his first sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by the miracles he did, the wonders and the signs, he delivered by, listen, the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. So he was delivered. Now this means delivered over to death. Delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, you have crucified him, you have put him to death. He doesn't just say the foreknowledge of God, but he says the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. It's not an accident. It's not God making the best of a bad job. It's not God tidying things up as they go along. It is rather God planning, counseling, purposing this, setting it in the councils of eternity from the foundation of the world. That doesn't bypass our will. It doesn't excuse our evil. It doesn't mean we're insignificant bit part players, like bits moving on a chessboard. Rather, our will is involved in it. He says that you took him by your lawless hands and you crucified him and put to death. But though it was your hands that did it and your lawlessness that was behind it, your sin, yet it's all by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. It is an appointment. It was appointed for us to die. It was appointed for Christ to die. I emphasized in the morning that your appointment is there. It's in the diary, God's diary. It's not in yours because you haven't a clue when it is. But someday, one day, there it is in God's diary. Exactly where you'll be, uh, when it is, and you won't miss that appointment. You won't be late for it. You won't be early for it. You can't reschedule it. God's made the appointment. The same is true with Christ. In all its details, that appointment was fixed. The place on a hill called the place of the skull, fittingly, the place of the skull outside Jerusalem. There, my son, you will die. The time, 26 AD, in the month of Nisan, right at the heart of the feast of the Passover, at 3 p.m., you will die. The manner of death is appointed to, down to its last detail. It must be the cursed death of the cross. No other, no other death will do. That's the death that is appointed, the cursed death of the cross in all its details. Now, I want to say just a couple of things about this appointment. Christ's appointment with death. And like ours, this is a mutual appointment. Our death isn't mutual. In its appointment, God simply appoints the day, the hour, the time, and the place he does it. This is by mutual appointment. This appointment to die is something that Christ enters into, and he enters into it as an equal party with his own Father. As an equal party with his own Father. You know as well as I do, and we just read it there, that all this was determined from the foundation of the world. Even John, 
in the vision that he sees of Christ in the midst of the throne, he sees him as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Slain in the purpose, his own purpose as the Son of God and in the purpose of his Father too. But to emphasize the mutuality of the agreement, to emphasize the fact that the, that the Father and the Son come into that appointment and make that appointment together, you'll notice that from time to time, even in his human condition, Christ emphasizes that his acquiescence is necessary for this death to take place. He has got to be willing to die. And at every point in his sojourn up to the cross, he makes it very, very plain that it's his choice to die, however difficult, however hard, however much a part of him resists it and wants to avoid it, it is his choice and his agreement to die that way. Even, even after he embraces the cup in Gethsemane, you'll remember when he wrestles with God there in prayer and he sweats blood, if it is possible, he says, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I desire, but as you will. He stands up majestic after that, truly uh, in a godlike way, and he, he yields himself into the hands of the attackers. Now, you'll remember at that point that the servant of the high priest takes a sword. Uh, sorry, sorry, Peter takes a sword, and he lashes out with a sword, and he cuts off the right ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. And the Lord turns to Peter and he says, put that away. He says, put it away. Interestingly, he heals the, priest, the servant of the priest's ear as well. But put away the sword, he says. Do you not realize that even now, even now, he says, I could call upon twelve legions of angels, twelve legions of angels. Even now, he says, I could do this. If this were my will, it would be done. No, of course, there's a sense in which we know it cannot. God's purpose is fixed. What will be will very much be. But that is Christ's way of saying to Paul, if this could be done, it would. If it my, were my will to do so, it would. In other words, I have acquiesced to this, Peter. I have acquiesced to this arrest. And had it been my will, I could have gone another way. I could have chosen something else, or something else would have been done. But no, this is my will. We'll see precisely why later. But I have chosen it. I could extricate myself from this, had that been my will. But no, he says. It isn't for me to do that. I'm here by my own volition. So although in one sense we can say that Christ can't miss his own appointment, of course he can't forget it, he can't reschedule his own appointment with death, we need to remember at every single point it's because he chose it. He chose that time, he chose that place, and he chose that way of dying. It is a mutual appointment. And that leaves this appointment more grand, especially when we consider the nature of the death, when we consider its violence, when we consider its ugliness, its utter obnoxiousness. It becomes more and more remarkable to think of it as a mutual appointment. I will go, and I will die, and I will die there, and I will die then, and I will die like that. I will die like that. The second thing about the appointment of Christ's death isn't just that it's a mutual appointment with his own will, but it's a known appointment. It's a known appointment. By that I mean that he knows it in his human condition. Now, that's not necessarily obvious. There's a way in which we must, we're probably bound to think, well, sh of course he knows it. Surely he knows it. He knows it as the Son of God. But we always have to bear in mind that he is in a human condition. He has taken a true body and a reasonable or a rational soul. He has a finite mind, and he dwells in a finite 
body. And it's no more wonderful that God should express himself through a finite mind than it is that he should express himself through a finite body. It's almost difficult to think of God somehow expressing himself through a single body. So it is difficult to think of him expressing himself through a finite mind. But so indeed he does. In the limitations of his humanity, there are obviously things that our Lord does not know because his mind is human. He always knows the truth. He always knows a vast amount of truth. But we are always to remember that that mind is human. No man knows the day or the hour except my Father who is in heaven. Now, that tells us that his knowledge of these things, unless imparted in a special direct way by the Spirit, comes through him through the word of God. Interestingly, that that makes a strong point of contact between ourselves and the Savior too. There's something wonderful in thinking of ourselves reading and the Holy Spirit of God opening the Scriptures as they're being read or as they're being preached and applying them to our souls. There's a wonderful fellow feeling with our Savior who himself is taught by the Father, taught through the Holy Spirit of God as he himself reads the Scriptures. Now, his understanding is so much higher and sharper, more penetrating than yours and mine. He doesn't just understand what's expressly taught clearly in propositional form in the Bible. He always, he is always able to understand what's taught there by good and necessary consequence. He can make these marvelous deductions. He can put two truths together and arrive at a third. He knows He never has a mistake in view of Scripture. It is always true and right and proper, and it's always before him. And as he grows up as a young man, he he never needs to ask what Isaac asked of his father. When his father was painfully and laboriously ascending Mount Moriah with, with the wood on Isaac's back and the fire in Abraham's hand, and Isaac says, the fire, he says, and the wood. But where is the sacrifice? And Abraham with an anguished heart says, my son, God, God, he says, will provide for himself a sacrifice. Christ never needs to ask that because he knows from his childhood that that's his calling, that's his place, and that's his, that's his duty. And as a young, well, boy becoming a man at the age of 12, famously his mother asks him, Where have you been, she says, rebuking him, rebuking him. Your father and I have looked for you sorrowing. And he turns as a young man rebuking her. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Your father and I have looked for you. I must be about my father's business. Mother, do you remember who I am? Mother, do you remember my calling? Mother, do you remember my nature? Mother, do you remember that you must raise me to let me go? Do you remember that my calling is so much higher than anyone else's calling in this world? Do you remember that? You must raise me to let me go, and I must be about my father's business. And even there and then, he's not saying that his father's business is somehow confined to sitting amongst the doctors of the law and answering the questions, or or even teaching the word of God. He knows that his father's business involves the consummate sacrifice. It involves the ultimate sacrifice. For greater loveth no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And he knows that. He knows that everything is working towards the ultimate goal, which is to lay down his life, a ransom for many, because the scriptures have taught him that. When this young boy devoured the Bible, sometimes, sometimes we can see that amongst ourselves. Sometimes we see an unusually, an unusually anointed child with, with a voracious appetite for the Scripture and almost a, an unusual understanding of it. How much more so in, in the example of our Lord? How often was that child seen with a scroll? How often was he seen in the synagogue? 
How often was he seen desperate to hear the words that were being taught and banded about by the elders, by the fathers? And when he read Zechariah, smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, he knows that's himself. He knows he'll be betrayed. He knows he'll be rejected because he reads in Isaiah that he will be like a root out of a dry ground, having no form and having no comeliness, that we should desire him. He knows the betrayal will be so hard because it's from someone so close. My familiar friend, Psalm 41, who ate bread with me at the table, has lifted up his heel against me in rebellion. He knows all that is coming. He knows there's a scourging, and he knows there's a crucifixion, because he reads that he was stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced in his hands and in his feet, Psalm 22. He knows all the little details of it. They gave me vinegar to drink, Psalm 69, when my thirst is great. He knows from Psalm 22 that they're going to cast lots for his clothing. He knows all that. And he knows especially that the content of the suffering will consist in the wrath of God and being forsaken on the cross. He knows that too. The cup that the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Shall I not drink it? The content of it. Um, he knew its content, and there were times, I'm sure, even, even as a youth, when he felt its content in, in apprehension of it. You know, sometimes when you can see something coming, even if it's a bit distant, you, you just feel it. By the, by the grace of God and by the kindness of God, you're able to move on, but sometimes it just casts its shadow again, and Sometimes you have to drink a bit of it almost in anticipation. So it was with the Lord till he came to Gethsemane and he somehow saw the full horror of it. He had to. There to give his assent intelligently as the priest, he had to. He had to. And it makes him sweat blood. It makes him sweat blood. But he knows that that's the death he's got to undergo because, as Paul tells us, he died according to the Scriptures. Uh, when it says that he died according to the Scriptures, I don't think that simply means that the Scripture said he would die, but that he dies in the way that the Scripture says he will die. He knows exactly that. I'll die there, then, and in this manner. Oh, friends, it's this manner that matters so much. It's the God-forsakenness of it all that matters so much. And it's no wonder that when the time comes, he teaches it carefully. It's a later part of his teaching. You'll notice that it doesn't come in at the beginning. It's at the end that he, he starts to reveal it. Three times he told the disciples plainly that he was going to be killed and that he would rise the third day, that he was going to be put into the hands of the authorities and scourged and killed on the third day. Interestingly, on all three occasions, the teaching doesn't sink in. In Mark 8, 31, the first time he taught it, Peter took him aside and rebuked him for it. Very graphic words in Greek. He pulls him to the side and says, no. This will not be so. The second time in Mark 9.31, we are told that they did not understand what he said. Now, that's quite staggering to us because the words are very plain. If you read them in Mark 9.31, very plain words, very plain teaching, but they did not understand. The last time in Mark 10.33, when he says again that he will be scourged and killed and rise on the third day, there's a deathly silence. But in the immediate aftermath, again, we can understand from the context that they have not processed the thing. Now, for the life of me, for long enough, I found it difficult to understand how a person could be told something very plainly three times and not understand it. 
But I've lived to see it. Probably in myself, too. But it's quite amazing, you see, how even a child of God can receive truth again and again. And if for some reason there's a barrier there, it doesn't permeate and it doesn't get through. And God has to do something in your life or with your experience in order for that thing to get through. That must have happened to them. They they didn't want to hear it. And because they didn't want to hear it, they just didn't get it. They just didn't get it, however plain it was. And sometimes, I suppose all preachers are sometimes plain and sometimes not plain. But whether we're plain or not, how it needs the Spirit of the Lord to prepare your hearts and to prepare mine to hear the Word of God. How we need to be ready to receive it in a life-changing and in a fruit-yielding way. How we need that. Hence our need to pray. To pray. I suppose you and I think sometimes that it's just enough to come to the church of God and to hear the word. And surely perhaps its plainness will be enough to convict. And you know it's not. Was it enough to convict and to change yourself? All of us as Christians. And you here tonight who are not Christians. You will not be transformed apart from the power of prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit working in your hearts and making you sensitive to the truth, they did not receive, they did not understand, and they did not process. But Christ knew. And I sometimes wonder if one of the reasons that it's written there three times is for us to know that he knew. We know that he knew. He didn't stumble into one providence after another. But he knew exactly where he was walking, and he knew what awaited him there. He knew in his humanity that he was dying, and that that awful, awful death was appointed for him. A mutual appointment by his own consent, and something that he knows all his life long. Does it make a difference to know the time of your death and the manner of your death? Oh, absolutely so. Absolutely so. I've often thought it's God's wisdom to hide that from ourselves. Especially if it involves a lot of grief, a lot of suffering, and a lot of pain. How thankful that that shadow just doesn't hang over you all your life long. And that you're not just thinking about it. It's normally better to face the unknown, especially if if it's a grim, grim scenario. If the alternative is hell on earth, then yes, I'd rather it was hidden. Our Lord didn't have that liberty. It's hard, friends, to look at an appointment with hell and keep your appointment. Isn't it? It's hard to look at an appointment with hell and still keep your appointment. There was a famous adversary of the Christian faith. I think he was in the 4th century, but I'm not sure about that. It was a man called Celsus. And Celsus used to contrast Socrates with our Lord Jesus Christ. Socrates, the great Athenian philosopher, had died in the 4th century. He famously died. He was condemned to death by the people of Athens. And his death involved taking a cup of hemlock. And um, hemlock, of course, was a poison. And Socrates famously made a great speech, and he took the cup of hemlock, and he took it as as the Stoic that he was. He took it stoically, as we would say, as a great Stoic. And Celsus was contrasting that man with our Lord when he said, as he would say himself in his disrespectful language, that that he couldn't look at it, that he was whimpering on the ground in Gethsemane, that he was a wreck contemplating dying. Well, apart, friends, from the fact that that wasn't our Lord dying in Gethsemane, Apart from the fact that our Lord himself was majestic and serene in his ascent to Calvary, what what a stupid comparison it is anyway. What a stupid comparison it is anyway. How ignorant do we have to be of the reality of things to make such stupid comparisons? It's one thing to look into a cup of hemlock. It's another thing to look into a cup of God's wrath and fury. 
I'm thankful to God that Christ trembled under that. Again, it brings his humanity into reach for myself. It reminds me that he was on all points genuinely tested as I was and yet without sin. It reminds me that he is my captain and my savior and reminds you of the same thing. Your savior, your captain, who has fellow feeling and compassion. Who can look at hell and be unmoved? So no silly comparisons. No silly comparisons. The fact of the matter is that all is lifelong The shadow of hell was cast over Christ, and how much more as he was about to ascend the hill of Calvary. Now, um, when he has a mutual appointment, um, when he enters it voluntarily, when he knows it all his life long and he's got to consciously move towards it, it raises the big question, why do it? Why do it? Why make the appointment in the first place? Why bind yourself? Why commit yourself to die when you are life, when your name is life, when you're the source of all living? Why die? And why die a hellish death? Literally. Well, you'll notice that the writer to the Hebrews doesn't call it a death. He calls it an offering. Now, when words like that are switched by the Holy Spirit, there's a reason for switching the words. Verse 20 actually says, sorry, verse 27 says, As it is appointed for men to die once, verse 28, so Christ was offered once. Why doesn't he say died once? Obviously, he wishes to highlight something that is true of his death, and that is simply that it is an offering. How different that makes his death from yours and mine. I'm conscious that there's a sense in which a Christian can speak of his death or her death as an offering. Paul said, uh, the time of my departure is at hand. I am about to be offered up, he says. There is a way in which we we could think of a martyr offering himself up to God. But, But all that is a shadow of this, and it's less than this. This is an offering in a higher sense. It's the ultimate sense. This is offering is sacrificial language. It's worship language. It's the language of the tabernacle. It's the language of the temple. It's the language of priesthood. What he's saying here is that Christ was offered as a sacrifice to God for you and me. Let me say that again. He was offered as a sacrifice to God, but for you and for me. What he's bringing before us here, and this fits into these chapters, and by the way, these are the chapters we're looking at at the prayer meeting, and please come to that prayer meeting. It's there to pray together and to deepen our knowledge in the Word of God. Be there if you can. Here he is speaking of Christ dealing as a priest, standing between you and me. And as a priest, what he has to do is deal with sin, isn't it? Sin is the great barrier between us and God. How we should hate sin. How we should hate it with every fiber of our being, whether we're Christians or not. And you notice that this offering is all in the context of sin. In verse 28, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Verse 26, the middle the middle part of verse 26. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. You put these two expressions together, bearing sin and putting away sin. Bearing sin and putting away sin. That's what his death is all about. We said in the morning that death is a penal thing, you see. Death has an element of judgment in it all the time. We die because we have sinned. God's frown is upon us, and he rips body and soul apart. Why should that happen to the Christ, holy, harmless, undefiled? Why should it happen to the Son of the living God, who never thought a thought out of place, who never spoke a word out of place? who never did a thing out of place. Why? 
because he's bearing your sins and he is putting your sins away. That's a sore thing. If you or I could understand what our sins deserve, if you and I could really see just a glimpse for a moment into the cup that awaits us if we die Christless, it would immediately impress upon us how serious a thing our sin is. How can you really go to sleep without dealing with it? How can you leave this house of God tonight without dealing with your sins? Now he took them. He took the sins of all his people and he took them onto himself so that he carried the punishment for them and he put them away, put them away from you in in a place where they can't touch you and where they can't reach you. Um, And that's to do with your justification. It, It means essentially that God has taken that whole bundle and he has laid it on Christ's back. And Christ's death is in order to absorb the wrath that is due to that, which must happen. Never forget that sin must always be punished. It's either going to be punished in you, the sinner, or it must be punished on on an alternative sin bearer. And the wonderful thing is that it's almost impossible to think how sin can be punished anywhere except in you, the sinner. I mean, how on earth can my sins be paid for by you? How can you deal with mine? How can I deal with yours? But the fact of the matter is that there is one place where sin can be dealt with, and that's on the back of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have the guarantee tonight from the Word of God that if you but believe in Christ, you can rest assured that your sins are on his back. Now, the gospel's called good news for a reason. There's no news as good as that. If you've been at all crushed by a sense of sin, there is no news as good as that. He took it onto himself, and he suffers for it. He atones. He dies as an offering to God for you, for me. You'll notice that he dies once. We die once, verse 27, so Christ is offered once, verse 28. Why is he offered once? Well, like yourselves, because he's got one life to live, one death to die, one offering to make. Just like we can't come back and have a second chance and die a second time, neither can Christ come back and get a second chance, and I say that with all reverence. He's got to get it right first time round. And that's one reason why the fury of the devil was let loose with Christ. I mean, the book of Revelation makes that plain. The Gospels, in their own way, make that plain. The sheer effort that Satan expended to bring Christ down, to get him to think the thought that's not right, to get him to say the word that was out of the place. And however often Christ stood on the precipice, he never fell off. And interestingly, even on the cross, there was come down from there and save yourself. Was that not in its own subtle way a devilish temptation just to extricate himself from the whole thing? But no, no, he's got, he's got to remain faithful. And praise God that he did remain faithful. I think the devil did expend all his energy in that task to get that man to fail was his mission accomplished, but he never got him to fail. And you see, he's got one life to live, and he's got to get it right. He did get it right. But there's also this. He offers himself once because no other offering is required. No other offering is required. Uh, The whole point at the end of Hebrews 9 is that the old high priest has to offer himself again and again. Remember that. That's the point he's making. Why does he keep going every year? Because somehow it's not done, he says. Whatever he's typifying, whatever he represents, is someone that hasn't yet been accomplished. The whole thing has been the whole thing has to be done again and again, year after year. But not with this man. He offers himself once because it's the perfect sacrifice of a perfect life. When he shouts it is finished in the cross. That means that he accomplished it. He accomplished it. If you just go back for a second, and I'm I'm just nearly finished. Chapter 7, verse 26. Chapter 7 and verse 26.
For such a high priest was fitting for us, and these are wonderful words, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. And listen to this, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Move forward to chapter 10 and verse 11. Chapter 10 and verse 11. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. They symbolize it, but they can't do it. But this man, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 14, for by one offering... He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. In other words, that one thing he did when he gave his one life has ensured our perfect state forever. Hence, uh, this is the reason that the Reformers were so appalled at the the teaching of the Mass and the performance of a Mass. You see, you'll remember that in, in 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 the sacrifice of the Mass... Supposedly, Christ is actually physically re-offered again because the bread and the wine supposedly transubstantiate into his actual body and blood. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that he is actually being offered physically there by each high priest. That's why they have to be so careful about the, the wine and the bread. And the priest himself consumes the wine and so on. It's, it's taught that it actually takes place. Now, for the Reformers, that wasn't just wrong It wasn't just wrong theology and wrong thinking. It was an attack on what actually happened and its beauty and its once-for-allness. Don't try and repeat it. It's unrepeatable. It's not necessary to repeat it. If you just make this sacrifice yours through faith, all your sins are dealt with, and they are dealt with forever. A single, once-for-all, perfect offering. Uh, My time has gone. I can't deal with the last point. I'll just throw the bone out and you can put some flesh on it yourself. But the last part tells us that to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear, Christ, a second time, apart from sin for our salvation. Epiphany, that's the word appear. He will have a second epiphany. He'll come a second time, this time apart from sin. Not a man of sorrows or acquainted with grief, not carrying any burden on his back. He comes in his glory, and he will accomplish our salvation. He'll do that, uh, as Second Thessalonians 1 describes for us. He'll do it wonderfully and glory, gloriously. I'm conscious that if I start it at all, I'll just carry on with it. So I'll, I'll leave it there, and may the Lord help us just to build these thoughts ourselves. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, we praise you for the appointment that was fixed in eternity. And however solemn and sobering our own appointment with death, it is as nothing in comparison with the Prince of Life himself appointed to die. And how thankful we are that he entered into such an appointment by his own voluntary consent. How thankful that in his humanity, when he knew of it, he did not shrink from it or attempt to evade it, that he walked into it, and that he did all that, even for our sake as sinners. For he didn't just die, he was offered up, and offered up once as a perfect sacrifice for sinners like ourselves. And so, Lord, we pray tonight that Every soul in here would recognize that and embrace the Savior. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.